Let's talk about some of the earnings performance of these companies, because I thought the way it was written in the intro, it really defied a lot of consensus expectations, which I think might be an understatement, because coming into 2023, the expectation was we were going to see a lot of these companies wither away and die, and they did almost the opposite. Well, I think we've, we've been seeing for mm -hmm. five or six quarters mm -hmm. much more strength in our portfolio companies and the borrowers, which are primarily private equity-backed companies, mm -hmm. uh, than the consensus, even than we expected. We expected this quarter to be pretty good. We didn't expect it to be this good. I think what we're seeing in part is the ability of private equity firms to really add value, to help and accelerate adaptation in their companies. Sure, there's lots of stories about truth, true stories that the pace of new transactions for private equity has slowed down. But firms have really done a great job working on improving productivity, beating not just consensus, but beating the aggregates for the overall economy. Well, let's talk about the improving uh, pr productivity. We did hear a lot uh, from uh, private equity firms and other private capital firms that were working with these companies and the direct lenders as well, this idea of being more efficient, cutting costs where you can now in the absence of at least what in the moment was basically little to no growth. Well, I think we're seeing growth. Mm -hmm. So so I, at least in the, the sectors we're involved in, I kind of reject the premise that there's no growth. Mm -hmm. But the increase in interest rates has okay. really transferred the margin of safety from the borrowers to the lenders. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's been pretty good for us. That has grabbed people's attention. And what we've seen as a difference in the way private equity firms prioritize and the way management teams prioritize is return on investment decisions have a lot fewer adjustments on them. Time frames are lower, expected rates of return are higher. Growth just for growth's sake isn't there, it's growth for growing profits. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as much as we think about private equity firms as always being focused on improving the value of businesses, mm -hmm. you know, 12 years of zero interest rates, you know, got a little bit to everybody. Well, on the topic of uh, private equity, one of the interesting points uh, in this report is that you write that despite some of the headlines that we're seeing about PE-backed companies, there's a lot of bearishness around uh, how those companies are faring. You actually found that they're doing pretty well, that the returns are pretty strong. Are you able to quantify that? Just how strong is strong? So. I think it's really important to distinguish between valuation and what returns to limited partners might be and the growth in EBITDA. You know, private equity firms got uh, ahead from a multiple point of view in terms of what they paid for companies in general in 19, 20, 21. So the multiples were high and there was an excess optimism about EBITDA adjustments. There were adjustments that just haven't come to pass. So what we're seeing is a natural cycle of a period of optimistic projections, uh, optimis optimism-based multiples, and now real EBITDA growth is catching up. And I think what we'll see in the second half of this year and the first half of next year, that private equity firms, that the companies have really grown into their valuations. Mm -hmm. Growing into their valuations. And I do want to back up a little bit and just talk about the business of private lending. Uh, this is a conversation Romaine and I have been having with people about, you think about what we saw in March, whether you want to call it a banking crisis, a banking hiccup, uh, you know, definitions there vary. But when it comes to the boom that we're now seeing in private credit, would we be having this conversation? We, would we still be seeing some of the uh, big numbers that we're seeing some of these private lenders put up had we not experienced that financial system stress at last March? I, I think so. You know, the the age of commercial banks actually holding loans to certainly middle market but even larger uh, borrowers in the private credit industry really diminished starting around 2000, 2001, 2002. What we've seen in the past couple of years is a diminished role for the big commercial banks, the money center banks, in arranging loans. And that's driven partly by the growth of private credit. I, I think that private credit provides PE firms a better value proposition, knowing your lender certainty, ability to take advantage of opportunities or deal with bumps. But we've also seen a slowdown in the formation of new CLOs, and the primary buyers of loans arranged by banks are CLOs. So we're seeing a long-term secular shift that I don't think really has that much to do with the Silicon Valley Bank type issues we, we faced early last year. I am curious with some of the private equity or firm, private credit firms, I should say, uh, is there more willingness now for them to hold on to some of these loans in a way that maybe in the past they would have either uh, tried to pass off to others or maybe even tried to renegotiate should there have been some sort of change in, in ownership of the underlying companies? Well, I, I think that when you talk about change of ownership, there, there is a, a growing degree of portability that sometimes gets negotiated in a new loan 
a new loan on an existing company where the private equity firm is thinking about selling it. They want to be able to sell the business with right. some certainty about the financing. So that's a, that's a relatively newer phenomenon. But historically, private credit, private lenders have been more flexible than broadly syndicated lenders because there's the ability to actually come to some cohesive decision. You have one or two or five lenders. You don't have 30 or 40 lenders playing to some least common denominator. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, narratives that's emerged around private credit over the past year or so has been that with interest rates going much, much higher, like you said, uh, people maybe got used to that 12-year stretch of zero interest rates, that um, some of these borrowers were seeking out private lenders to get you know, better rates than they would at the banks. With rates now coming down, or at least poised to come down, do you see banks coming back as competition, or do you even view banks as competition here? Look, everybody's a competitor in one way or another. Even some of the private equity firms are competitors with us uh, with their own credit arms. I think that the big banks are trying to adapt to a new world in which private credit has a much, much higher market share. I think that investors are seeking out private credit, uh, in part because of the concerns some investors have that risk-free rates are going to come down. I mean, when you look at 5.5% treasuries that looked for a while like they might go to 6, you know, it's less exciting to think about a 9 or 10 or 11% return. But with the forward curves the way they are, I think we see some of the smartest advisors and smartest investors saying, hey, wait a minute, it's not just what are treasuries today, think about what you're going to be earning over the next three to five years. Yeah, that reinvestment risk, uh, definitely front and center. And just to bring it back to your report before we let you go, so the middle market seems to be doing fairly well, but what are the concerns still out there? A lot of that macro bearishness may be overblown in 2023, but what are the risks in 2024? Well, I, I don't know that, uh, that the consensus is necessarily right about inflation. Wage growth is still very, very high. The, the tracker I like to look at the best is the Atlanta Fed. They have same job and change job wage trackers, which takes out the effect of mix, more service jobs, less service jobs, and it's running five to six percent wage growth. Well, you know, maybe for private equity-backed companies that really have high productivity growth way above the market, that's okay, but our productivity growth in the economy is just not there. We've got low unemployment, high wage growth, strong consumer demand. I think that uh, inflation is a risk. Another risk is you know, we inherently don't really lend to interest rate sensitive sectors, and if rates should stay higher for longer, eventually that's going to have more impact on autos and housings and then some spillover effects. 